Morning, everyone. We'll wait for everyone to get here and then we'll make a start. I feel like I should be playing some music or something like this. There would usually be a hum of people chatting in the room, wouldn't there? We've got lots of people saying good morning. So, right, I will uh, um, make a start and move to sharing my screen now. So, Welcome everyone. Um, it's a real honor to welcome you to the Connected Everything annual conference. Um, it's a conference that's completely different from the conference we were planning or expecting, um, but we're really looking forward to the next two days. Um, for those of you who haven't met me before, I'm Sarah Sharples. Um, I'm the lead for the Connected Everything um, Network, but actually have had very little to do with the organization of the conference because I'm uh, delighted that uh, my colleagues, um, uh, Peter Green, Fiona Charnley, uh, Doug McFarlane, um, Nick Watson, and uh, of course our project lead, um, uh, Deborah Fernshaw, um, has been uh, really sort of taking the strain of organising um, the programme for the next two days. So um, really hope you're looking forward to this. We should also mention that this is a, a sort of a new experience for us all using this type of technology for um, the conference. And we're really grateful for um, Sally Hawkes and her team, who's providing us with lots of technical support in the background. So um, we're really interested in people's feedback as to how this experience works in terms of um, a conference. And, um, and if there are things that we need to fix as we're going along during the conference, then please do shout and uh, um, we will um, uh, make any changes that we're able to make. So. I just really wanted to welcome you to um, what we're hoping will be our largest conference yet. Of course, one of the joys of technology um, is that we're able to um, access um, uh, each other and our material and our networking opportunities um, uh, without the need for um, uh, travel. And so you can see that not only have we managed to um, reach all four nations of the UK, um, but we've also got, um, I think one, two, three, four, four or five continents um, represented in the conference over the next two days as well. So welcome to you all. Um, as you'll see from the technology, we've um, chosen this technology to enable as much of that normal conference experience to come through as possible. So not only will there be the formal um, keynote presentations or plenary presentations that we've got from a range of speakers from industry and from academia. We've also got the workshop settings and then slightly more informal conversations uh, such as the ones you just saw um, at the tables before we um, uh, had this part of the conference as well. So please do take advantage of all the opportunities the technology brings and, uh, and, and use the opportunities you would normally at a conference to meet each other um, and make new connections and hopefully build new partnerships. So some of you um, I know are very familiar faces and have been engaging with the Connected Everything Network for the last three years or so, um, but others may be new to the network. Um, and it's worth us just reflecting on the changes that we've made um, in, in terms of the network as a whole um, during a global pandemic. So, as some of you may remember, this is um, the fourth year that the Connected Everything Network um, has been in existence, but it's the first year of its sort of new iteration um, as Connected Everything 2. Our goal as a network is to accelerate research and implementation of digital manufacturing in the UK and worldwide. And the focus that we have in Connected Everything is through bringing together people from different disciplines um, to think about challenges that we need to address in order to achieve that acceleration of digital manufacturing, whether it's through technology development, um, acceptance of technology, um, thinking about the way in which technology might sit within an existing supply chain, thinking about the impact on people. 
So the challenge that we face, like everyone else in this um, sort of virtual room over the last few months is how do we take that mission of the network and transform it into a setting when the very essence of a network, which usually revolves around meeting face to face, is no longer possible. So we've moved some of our key activities online. This is our annual conference, which, as you'll remember, is a conference we we deliberately have as quite an informal um, focused conference where we really, really try and get that sort of collective view as to what the priorities and the issues we need to address are um, to help inform the work of the network, but also inform our own research. Um, last week, um, there was a very successful summer school that was held online, um, run by colleagues at the University of Nottingham. And, uh, and we'd really like to um, thank the Smart Products Beacon and the Horizon Digital Research team for their leadership in that. Um, uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, what happened at that um, summer school in a bit. Um, one of the things that Connected Everything has as its mission is not only to lead acceleration of research in digital manufacturing, but also to bring together a range of other funded activities which are looking at digital manufacturing or related topics. So our network of networks, which we established early in uh, January, has been continuing. Um, and we've particularly had some focused conversations around what those of us in this research area should be doing to support the response to COVID-19. And we've managed to grow the network. So since the start of Connected Everything 2, so our new um, uh, round of funding started in September 2019, um, we're very pleased to say um, we've now got five, 357 network members um, uh, and a new 70 members have joined since September. And our focus remains um, on multidisciplinarity, um, building communities, building careers. One of the things that's lovely about Connected Everything is the extensive engagement and opportunity we get um, from those of us who, those of us, it used to be me, um, at the earlier stage in their uh, careers. I know I would have loved something like this at the earlier stage um, in my career to sort of build those connections that um, hopefully will become um, the leadership activities um, in digital manufacturing in the years to come. So it's all about thinking about how we can accelerate digital manufacturing research, digital manufacturing implementation. So we've been very busy since September 2019, um, global pandemic or no global pandemic. So um, uh, as many of you will be aware, we've um, launched our call for feasibility studies. The nature of a network plus as funded by EPSRC is that actually the majority of the funds are administered by the network to be distributed to others to deliver fundamental research activity. Um, we had a very competitive round of funding in January 2020, where we funded three more studies and they're presenting to you this morning to talk about their goals and their ambitions. Um, some of those studies have inevitably been slightly delayed in terms of um, the, uh, the activities that were being planned to do. But we're very keen to see that all of the activity within Connected Everything is still able to um, get back to practical data collection as quickly as possible and retain the mission. Um, of accelerating digital manufacturing research. And we've had a more recent call um, that's been out in the last couple of months, specifically focusing on some of the challenges around regulation and standards um, that we know are sometimes seen as a bit of a barrier to implementation of digital manufacturing. Um, and so the, the shortlisting has taken place and we've got um, a panel pitch this Friday where we're hoping to be able to award more feasibility studies with that particular focus. Um, the executive group has been uh, meeting regularly um, to um, uh, steer the work. And we're also really pleased to have um, the guidance from our advisory group who've been joining us as well. So as we said last week, the summer school, um, which was run um, through the University of Nottingham, um, brought together 27 delegates over three days. Um, and the topics that they um, discussed and worked on in a collaborative form included um, uh, collaborative robotics or cobots, um, uh, particularly focusing on a COVID-19 world and thinking about the way in which these technologies might be most helpfully implemented in a home environment, in a healthcare setting, and in agriculture. And it was really great to hear about the diversity of ideas that came across 
um, and uh, the engagement that we've got. And we know that summer schools can produce a really, really important impact for early career researchers in terms of thinking about um, their own ideas, perhaps their own quite focused research and how it fits into the wider context of things. We've also had our meeting of the Network of Networks. This was pre-pandemic, so we, we met in person in London in January 2020. And at that point, um, we identified a couple of key priorities for us to work together as networks on, um, as well as the work that we're separately delivering as individual networks. One of the things that we're really pleased we've, we've managed to achieve um, in uh, today's and tomorrow's conference is uh, something that's very close to my heart, and I'm sure many of the people in this room, is the importance of representing diversity um, amongst those who are working in an area. We know that diversity leads to better science, better decisions, and a more inclusive environment where everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed. And we were very painfully conscious of the number of environments where the majority of presenters were um, uh, not necessarily representing the diversity of the community that's got the potential to influence digital manufacturing. So we're really pleased that um, uh, we've, we've got a diverse group presenting um, in the next two days, but we're also really keen to make sure um, that we have a mechanism to enable all networks to identify excellent speakers who can be drawn from a diverse group. We also um, realised that um, there is a little bit of gap in terms of support for networks. Um, as many of you will know, people like me do very little of the work in terms of leading a network. And it's the managers and the leaders of the networks who are often the people who make sure that um, the activities really work in the way that, that we want them to. Um, and so one of the things we're doing is bringing together all of those who manage networks um, to make sure they've got a community and we can build that professional expertise and best practice, sharing the way in which we're delivering networks, both in normal conventional settings, but also recognising the challenges that we're facing now um, as a result of COVID-19. So I'll just end with this presentation by um, saying thank you to all of our conference um, contributors. Um, and of course, in many cases, these people are the sort of the front people um, who are representing the work that I'm sure lots and lots of other students and staff are contributing to behind the scenes as well. So we're really um, looking forward to hearing about um, the work that's being presented today that's everything from early stage concepts to um, uh, the real practical understanding of the opportunities for digital manufacturing in an industrial setting. So I think I've now stopped sharing my screen. So um, hopefully you can uh, um, sort of just see uh, me and hear me now. Um, so um, I'm really pleased now to hand over to um, uh, Martin Aston. Um, just to explain to everyone, the way we're organising the conference is the conference presentations themselves are pre-recorded. Um, this is um, to really make sure that um, we don't have any or we minimise the likelihood of technology failures. I won't say we won't have any because that, that will cause the kiss of death on the uh, conference right now. One of the great things about this, if you've not been involved in a setting like this before, is that um, the presenters are all here. They're all watching themselves, which I know I've done it myself. is slightly disconcerting. But they can see the question and answers coming up on the chat on the right hand side. So please do use um, the question and answer screen to ask any questions that you'd like to raise to the presenter. Um, I'll then come in at the end and chair a question and answer session with the presenter themselves. Um, but one of the great things as a presenter is you get to see the questions coming up so you can have a bit of a think about the answer you want to give or even give a quick answer yourself during the Q&A. Um, so I really hope you enjoy this format of the presentation and I'm really happy now to hand over to Martin Aston from Airbus who's going to be talking about engineering net zero. Hello everyone, I hope you're all keeping well in these challenging times. Uh, this is a first for me, uh, recording a presentation rather than standing in front of an audience, so, so apologies if the production is not as slick as it could be. Uh, despite attending hundreds of online meetings over the past few months, I still find some of the aspects of the, of the various IT systems somewhat challenging. 
I also apologize you're not able to see me. Uh, I'm recording this on a Mac and, and as is usual, the, the often strained relationship between Microsoft and Apple mean that the functionality is, is somewhat restricted. So apologies for that. My name is Martin Aston and I shall be providing an insight into some of the challenges and also opportunities associated with engineering the so-called net zero. In particular, I should be highlighting issues associated with regulation and assurance with the development and production of products needed to actually achieve that ambition. But, but first, some background on me. I work for Airbus and have done so for almost 40 years, although today I'm presenting on behalf of the team that is developing the Brunel Challenge Initiative, and I'll come back to that a bit later on. During my time in Airbus, I've had numerous jobs. My core discipline is actually aerodynamics, and I spent a number of years running the wind tunnel facility at the Filton site near Bristol. But, but in the early 2000s, I was asked to take on a new challenge. This was leading a large research program aimed at understanding how advances in computing would change our approach to engineering. As a result of that, for four years, I was seconded out of Airbus to set up and run CFMS, uh, an organization dedicated to progressing digitalization in engineering and an organisation that still exists today. I then returned to Airbus uh, and since then I've led a number of large collaborative research projects associated with digitalisation in engineering uh, and how it applies to wing design in particular. For the past, past few years I, I've led the team developing the Brunel Challenge proposal. Uh, it's a multi-sector initiative that aims to transform engineering capability through even greater use of advanced digital techniques. It's brought together almost all of UK industry and, and many universities as well. And we're currently in the process of securing government funding to, to enable us to formally launch. It's worth pointing out I'm not an expert in regulation, but, but during my long and varied career within the highly regulated aerospace industry, I've had to deal with regulations and regulatory processes all my career. And I've often had to interface with organisations such as the CAA and UCAS. Having engaged with experts in the topics over the past, past few years as well as, as part of Brunel Challenge, uh, I've gained an insight into the future trajectory of regulation and assurance uh, and, and where research is needed within that topic. Digitalisation is going to play a key role in the future of engineering and production, but, but we need to understand why and how we can make full use of its capability. So it's worth spending a little bit of time just explaining what engineering is. Uh, engineering is very misunderstood by the general public, not helped by the fact that the, the media's portrayal of engineers as, as people who mend boilers. Uh, in fact, Google insists it's someone who wears a high-vis vest and hard hat. Fundamentally, engineering is the conversion of science to reality. Uh, it, it's the use of knowledge to define viable products. But the boundaries around engineering are actually quite blurred and much of what is regarded as manufacturing, I, I would say, falls into to the perimeter of, of what we define as engineering. Uh, sometimes that aspect is known as manufacturing engineering. But what many people perceive as manufacturing is actually the serial production phase of a product life cycle by which time many of the decisions that define the product, how it's made, what materials are used, what the supply chain looks like have already been made. So clearly engineering is a huge topic, but today we're just gonna focus on regulation within that process and why engineering and production is so tightly regulated and why we need to carry out research into regulation and also assurance principles. So what challenges does industry face over the next few years? Uh, within the Brunel Challenge organization, we, we cluster them into three categories, as you can see here, societal, technical, and then commercial and political. The climate change issue hasn't gone away. In fact, it's not just climate change. It, it's looking at environmental issues uh, as a whole. Uh, that, if anything, is accelerating and the awareness and concern associated with that is growing all the time. What's hit us over the last few months has, has identified very complex and rapidly changing economic conditions all around the world. But also we're seeing people having evolving career ambitions. Uh, in the past, the idea of a job for life was, was not unusual, but with the so-called Generation Z, uh, they have different values. And, and the idea of staying in one job and, and one company their entire working life is, is not something they look forward to. So that gives us particular issues in terms of corporate knowledge. From a technical point of view, 
Well, if we're going to meet those those environmental issues, if we're going to develop products affordably and quickly, we've got to develop these unproven products and we've got to get them right first time. Uh, we won't have the opportunity to do long development programs, but we're going to have to use complex integration, uh, integration of technologies to actually give the performance that, that we need. And finally, uh, we need to consider assurance and compliance. Uh, at the moment, we rely very much on physical testing. Uh, and the picture you can see there is a car without a steering wheel. It's a good example of, of why we've got to address this, this assurance challenge to meet the regulations in terms of safety associated with that car. At the moment, using existing uh, product assurance processes, you've got to drive that car 11 billion miles and it would take 500 years. So, so clearly something has got to change uh, in, in terms of assurance. And then we're also seeing blurring of, of the traditional sector boundaries and emergent business models. Uh, the picture you can see on the bottom left there is of an Airbus uh, flying car. Uh, the question I pose is, is, is it an aircraft? Is it a car? Or if you talk to someone like Uber, it's, it's an information gathering system. So, so clearly business models and sector boundaries that, that we've had for many years and are now fundamentally different. But also, even despite the, the recent COVID crisis, we're living in an increasingly globalized world, world with, with new competition, but also new collaboration. Uh, and we need to understand how we live within that environment and, and operate accordingly. Taking a little bit of time to understand what the environmental challenge is. Uh, there's two aspects I'll cover today. The first of which is, is carbon, CO2, in the atmosphere in this particular case. And what we can see here is, is the so-called temperature anomaly, uh, but also the level of CO2 in the atmosphere. And, and this slide here shows uh, the trend in CO2 and, and temperature over the last thousand years, although there is data that goes back millennia. What we can see here is that there would appear to be clear evidence that, that mankind is having an effect on carbon in the atmosphere and, and the, tr the trajectory of temperature is, is increasing, if anything. The other thing is, is plastic waste. Um, what we can see here is, is the growth, if you like, in cumulative plastic waste uh, projected out to 2050. Um, it's almost an exponential rise and, and clearly that rise in, in plastic waste is not sustainable but it's not an easy problem to solve. Uh, as we can see here is that fishing line takes 600 years to degrade. Uh, even nappies take 450 years. So governments are now increasingly uh, aware as a result of, of the COVID lockdowns where people have got used to uh, seeing clean skies and, and sunshine. Uh, and so as a result of that, governments are paying more attention, shall we say, to, to the future uh, of the environment. And, and probably as a result of COVID, we will see new regulations in terms of environmental impact. So we said at the start of the presentation that uh, we were talking about engineering net zero. Uh, net zero is, is the ambition, if you like, that, that our impact on on the planet as a result of operating all our transport systems and such like is, is effectively zero. But it's a very complex systems challenge. And let's look at one example. So here's a hydrogen uh, electric powered aircraft. Uh, the only emissions are water. So you might think that replacing all our existing kerosene powered aircraft, uh, to replace them all with, with hydrogen powered aircraft, will solve the problem and that that aircraft in itself will deal with all the issues that we face. But actually that aircraft is part of a very complex system. Um, we have to generate power to generate the hydrogen. We then have to distribute the power, distribute the hydrogen to the point where it's used. That aircraft will operate within an airport environment. We need to consider the ground operations at that airport. We need to consider the surface transport uh, how do people get to and from that airport? And then on the right hand side, we've actually got the production of, of that air, aircraft with its battery systems and, and complex materials. We have to have the raw materials to actually develop that, that aircraft and produce it. We need to then distribute those materials because chances are they will come from other parts of the world and will be needed to be 
transported in bulk to where they can be converted into components and, and assembled. So then there's the component production itself. We then have to distribute the components. Chances are they will be coming from different places in the world. And then we have to assemble it. And then we also need to consider the actual airspace and air traffic management because we can't just move where we want because we need to consider the safety of aircraft operations. They can't just go point to point at the moment because we need to fly down uh, air corridors. And then there's the actual understanding of the climate and, and the atmospheric modeling. So that aircraft has to operate within a system. And then ultimately we have to think about how we actually dispose of that. So although an actual effectively zero emission aircraft in itself might look like a good idea, if we're actually going to achieve net zero, we need to consider the whole system that is associated with both producing and operating that product. So that's clearly a very, very big problem to solve, but uh, let's try and bring it down to earth slightly. Let's look at that uh, hydrogen powered aircraft. Let's look at the different systems within an aircraft of that type in terms of, of hydrogen power, but also batteries. Clearly, there's a lot of integration within that aircraft. And as before, we need to consider the disposal in terms of the environmental impact. But actually designing and producing an aircraft of that type is a very complex integration challenge in itself. We need to think about the requirements. Uh, we need to think about what are the actual success metrics, both deterministic and non-deterministic. Traditionally, we've always designed products to very deterministic requirements, but increasingly, as we move to things like net zero, those requirements will become increasingly non-deterministic. And we have to operate within a, a regulatory framework. The design of that, that aircraft, that integrated system, cannot be done by one organization. We're going to require real-time collaborative design. We're going to need to understand some of the manufacturing and production constraints. We're going to have to look at how those, those organizations developing that actually operate within a system. But also we need to consider more complex things like how do we actually store the data how do we actually retain it? How do we make sure it's there? And if organizations are going to be sharing data within that development environment, we need to think about factors such as cybersecurity. The simple fortress data is not applicable. We need to share data, but we need to do it securely. And then there's the assurance. We, we mentioned the autonomous car earlier, the 500 years, 11 billion miles. Clearly, an aircraft is even more complex than that. So we need to consider concepts such as smart testing. Do we actually validate the design process rather than the product itself? And how much of the actual product do we need to test? If we go back to the 50s and 60s, we had large multi-year development program and we've been living off the knowledge bank of those programs for many years, but we won't have that luxury going forward. So we're gonna to have to look at new ways of doing assurance new ways of, of actually almost forecasting what is likely to go wrong with that product. We need to look at mathematical analysis, probabilistic, uh, and novel ways of actually managing uncertainty. And then there's the production of a, a, an aircraft of that type. We're going to have to have a fully integrated supply chain with all the compatibility issues that go with that. We're going to have to use new materials. We're going to have to use new manufacturing processes. But also we're going to have to have new assembly processes because it's a far more integrated product than anything we've had before. So as we can see, even though that system of systems challenge of net zero looks complex, even the products within it are going to be complex as well. So why is regulation so important? Why do we have so many regulations? Well, there's a number of reasons, one of which is safety. We need to make sure that the product is safe to operate, but also we need to consider safety in the production process as well. Then there's the environmental impact. We need to make sure that the, the impact on the environment of operating that product is minimized or at least controlled. We also need to consider the disposal of the product and the impact that has on the environment as well. And then there's business effectiveness and compatibility. All the products we're talking about here are a complex integration 
of a number of different components that could come from different countries, different suppliers. And we need to make sure that the initial assembly process is efficient and, and also effective. But things wear over time and, and products will have to be repaired and we need to make sure that that repair process, that maintenance process is also efficient and effective. So if this system works so well, uh, and has been for some time, why do we need to do research? Why need do we think about different ways of actually addressing regulation and assurance? Well, as we've seen, products are going to become far more complex than they are today. If we're to operate in this system of systems approach that we saw earlier to actually achieve net zero, then clearly we're going to need more complex, more radical solutions to those products. And achieving those products will require far greater integration of our supply chains. Uh, we'll start to have integrated supply chains in terms of the development of those products as well as the production of them as well. And we need to make sure that that entire supply chain operates as seamlessly and as effectively as possible. And then clearly, as we saw from the example of the autonomous road vehicle, uh, if it's going to take 500 years to actually demonstrate compliance with regulation, then that's not a feasible solution. And we need to consider acceleration of those development timescales, but also the assurance timescales in particular. Well, industry is at a turning point. In fact, society as a whole is at a turning point. We're facing many complex and rapidly changing challenges and situations. In fact, many of the challenges we see today, we weren't even aware about just a few weeks ago. But we mustn't forget that every challenge is also an opportunity. And for those who are ambitious and willing to embrace change, those opportunities are there. We've seen that achieving net zero is very difficult and especially difficult if we want to retain the lifestyle we currently enjoy. There is no technological silver bullet. It will require that system of systems approach, requiring innovative collaboration across the entire value chain. It will require collaboration across sectors and potentially even across countries as well. It's highlighted the challenges in terms of the design, production and operation of those complex products. We need to ensure that the interface between all stakeholders is effective. We need to maintain levels of safety, but also we need to address the efficiency and effectiveness of those products within that systems environment. Regulation is a fundamental part of engineering production. And it's key for ensuring that integration of that system is effective and carefully managed as well. Digitalization and the innovative use of data and mathematics will play a key role in enabling us to develop and also demonstrate the effectiveness of those products within that system of systems. It's a complex but exciting challenge and, and high quality research is needed to actually make that a reality. It's a huge opportunity for those who rise to that challenge. So I hope you found this insight useful and interesting. I wish you well and thank you for listening. Thank you, Martin. Um, that was a great presentation, I think, provided a really helpful um, overview and set the scene for um, uh, the, the different types of challenges that I think we're all thinking about um, in our research and in our industrial settings. So, um, Martin, I think we're now join me. Brilliant. So, um, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I thought I'd actually ask you the the first question. So, if I can encourage people to um, put questions on the Q and A, and I'll I'll work through those. But actually, my first question was a personal one to you. I thought it was really interesting that you said um, <laughs> a, a few years ago your your job was to sort of look at how computing um, uh, would change engineering and almost what the role of computing in engineering um, would be and, and how to enable um, uh, the, the sort of taking advantage of that. I was just interested in how that's panned out. What, what surprised you? Um, has, do you think engineering has taken advantage of computing as much as it could? And, and uh, maybe there are some technologies that have just transformed things in a way that you wouldn't maybe have anticipated when you first started out in that particular element of work. I, I think in terms of where we set out and where we are, I don't think we've made as much progress as we thought. Uh, I, I think what's quite interesting is 
we're almost overusing computing. So we're looking at it for the sort of complex simulation technologies rather than the obvious uses. Uh, and the examples I always give is if you look at social media and, and how that has actually embraced computing power completely. It's not looked at how things were done before. You know, if, if you look at social media, it, it's not a digitalized phone system. They've completely transformed the approach they're taking to communication. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at what we've done in engineering, we've tried to digitize how we used to do things in the past. Uh, and we need to, to make that, that change of culture, if you like, and stop trying to digitize how we used to do it and look at it in a completely new way. Um, and like I said, I don't think we've even started yet. I, I, I think we're dabbling, if you like, rather than making that real change. I think that's that's a really interesting perspective. So I can see there's 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 one question from my colleague Pete in the in the question and answer, which is around the um, the hydrogen ex, um, aircraft mm -hmm. example that that you used as an example. Um, so so I wonder if you could just sort of follow up on that. What do you think are the main barriers to adoption, and 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 how do we overcome perhaps some of the initial environmental cost of of, of taking on sort of manufacture of um, uh, of new aircraft? Mm -hmm. I, I I think one of the problems we got is physics tends to get in the way. Um, what, what you find is in terms of energy density, kerosene is, is incredibly high compared to pretty well everything else we're looking at. And we've recognized that we do need to do something, although air travel is actually a remarkably small contributor to the overall carbon uh, issue uh, in, in the environment, but it's a very high profile one. Uh, we've got other issues such as contrails and such like. The, the issue we've got is that to actually make a viable aircraft, because hydrogen is not as efficient as kerosene, you have to store a lot of hydrogen. And in storing that hydrogen, the actual surface area of the aircraft goes up, and so the drag goes up. So as I said, physics has this annoying habit of getting in the way. And But I think this is why we need to look at it as a system of systems and actually say, right, what is the actual problem we're trying to solve? So, so rather than have one aircraft that fits all, uh, missions like we do today do we have specialized aircraft in, in which case the manufacturing side is, is going to be key because if we're going to make more smaller aircraft then we've got to get the production costs mm -hmm. right down uh, because the unit cost cannot be what it is today so I, I, I think there is no main barrier it's it's a case of chipping away at all those different elements in that system um, and, and addressing all of them and it feels a little bit like in, in that area as well. It's that dis it, it's it's that disrupting the way of thinking, isn't it? In terms of rather than using the model we've used in our previous um, manufacture of aircraft, thinking right, how do we do it differently in this context? So, mm -hmm. I had I had a question, another question for you as well around <coughs> systems thinking. I'm a very strong proponent of systems thinking in in all types of contexts. But one of the things that I personally struggle with is that I think it, it works really well conceptually but I sometimes struggle to recommend the right types of tools or techniques <clears throat> to truly embrace systems thinking. And I was wondering if from the industrial perspective, you could maybe talk about, are there any tools that you think have been particularly helpful to you as an industrialist, mm -hmm. either to support your own systems thinking or encourage others to embrace systems thinking? Again, I'd go back to the point I was making earlier. I think the tools that we've got at the moment are actually quite old fashioned. Uh, what, what you tend to do is spend a lot of effort into effectively modeling the system that you have today. Um, it's got its place. It's got us thinking about uh, looking at systems approach to life. But again, I think we're just scratching the surface. I, you know, I, I think we really should be looking for best practice elsewhere. And, and I think if you look at engineering, if you look at manufacturing, we tend to be looking inward to see how we can actually change things for the better rather than looking outside of our own regime and looking at where people are already using things far more effectively. Mm. And, and I think from a systems thinking point of view, again, I would look to, to social media. You know, if you look at what they're doing, they're, they're doing massive networking type activities, which is effectively what systems thinking is. Um, yes, we do have tools available now, but but I think they could be so much better if if we were more ambitious, less inward looking and, and, and start looking at best in class.
where, who are the best people at doing it? Mm, that, that, that's, that's that's really interesting perspective. I I wonder if somewhere like healthcare as well is, which I know has a lot mm -hmm. of thinking about systems thinking as well, is is another area we can learn on. So I can see we've mm -hmm. we've got a question from Stefania, which is around the Brunel challenge, yep. and um, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about whether the Brunel challenge <coughs> um, uh, covers sort of concurrent design and um, uh, and how that might be incorporated. The answer is yes when it gets going uh, in, in terms of where in fact uh, this afternoon I've got another call uh, in, in terms of Brunel challenge we're at that rather awkward phase at the moment where it isn't quite ready to go we're, we're discussing with industry we're discussing with government in terms of how do we actually launch the program uh, the latest thinking is that, that we'll probably sort of work much more closely with the made smarter uh, program to achieve that mm -hmm. Um, it, in terms of what we, we aim to achieve with Brunel Challenge, it's that transformational change that I keep referring to. Uh, and, and if you look at concurrent design, I mean, I know the, the ESA one um, looks very much at the sort of the, the human interface, if you like. It's your classic sort of uh, minority report, sort of big screen and everybody working together. I actually think there's an awful lot behind that that we need to do uh, that, that in terms of the information exchange and, and the actual information management. But certainly concurrent design is key. And, and what they're doing in ESA at the moment is key to that. That that The picture of the aircraft I showed you, you cannot design, you cannot even make each element of that inde independently. It is, it is a completely integrated product. Uh, and we're going to have to move towards concurrent design. But there's so many things we've got to address for us to be able to achieve that. And uh, there's a question here from uh, Saeed Ali. Um, has there been any effort from complex systems research community um, to integrate uncertainty um, through probabilistic modeling, um, which can sort of help support um, key performance indicators for net zero, but retaining that systems of systems approach? So I think it's that integration yep. of uncertainty that's interesting to understand. Big time. I mean, I've been involved in uncertainty modeling now for what, the last eight years? Um, I, I think it's something that will become even more important going forwards. Um, one of the big challenges we've got is, is unknown unknowns. Uh, and, and if you look at how we've tended to develop products up to now, we've relied on our knowledge base, our experience. If you've got products that go beyond your existing knowledge base, whereas in the past we did lots and lots of testing, what we're going to have to do is take a more mathematical approach to that. So the actual modeling of uncertainty is going to be absolutely key uh, to achieving net zero and developing the sort of products that, that I was showing earlier. So I can see we've got a couple more questions and a couple more minutes. So I wonder if you could just um, uh, say a little bit more about what Brunel Challenge might aspire to look mm -hmm. at in terms of regulation assurance and direct commissioning of projects. And obviously we've got Chris Courtney talking from the Manufacturing Made Smarter perspective yep. tomorrow. Yep. So it'd be really nice to sort of tie those together as well. Very much so. So there are, there are two mm -hmm. topics. Uh, we've been involved probably for about the past three years focusing on, on what Brunel Challenge actually looks like. There are two topics that have come to the top, one of which is what we're calling collaborative co-design. So what we were talking about a second ago, the other one is regulation and assurance. Mm. Something has to be done with, with the assurance process and, and the regulatory process. Because it's very much a backward looking process. Uh, what we tend to do is look at where things have gone wrong and said, we don't want that to happen again. If the products that we're developing, if the systems we're developing are way beyond our experience envelope, we don't have any choice but to look at some sort of modeling of what could happen, uh, a sort of more probabilistic approach. If we don't change the system, we will not be able to develop those products. Uh, and so, mm -hmm. so there's a huge research area that is saying, right, how do we adopt a more forward looking approach to regulation and assurance? rather than the sort of backward looking approach that we take today. So huge topic. And it's that it's that proactivity rather than reactivity, focus on process rather than the product that exactly. I think is really, really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think we probably need to close now because, um, and I can see there's a couple more mm -hmm. questions there. Um, I'd like to um, thank you very much, Martin, for a really interesting presentation. I loved your definition of engineering. The conversion of <laughs> science to reality is one that I'd never really sort of heard articulated like that before. And, and I think uh, is a really helpful definition that encompasses 
um, the multidisciplinarity of the type of goals that we're trying to achieve in Connected Everything. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you very much. No um, if you could, if you do get a chance to answer any of the questions on the Q&A, <laughs> um, then that would be brilliant as well. Um, and, uh, and thank you all very much. So we can't give you a proper round of applause, but I can give you a round of applause. So thank you. So I over to Ali, who has finally agreed to chair the next session. Thank you very much, Ali. So um, Ali is going to be introducing our feasibility studies, which are um, the new feasibility studies which have been awarded this year. Um, and we've got the same format with the um, uh, recorded presentations and then um, short questions and answers at the end. So over to you, Ali. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank. You. Can you hear me uh, all? All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth um, Connected Everything conference. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank organizers for inviting me to chair this very exciting set of feasibility study session. Um, being part of a very first batch of feasibility studies which were funded through this uh, Connected Everything Network Plus, I think feasibility studies are very uh, sort of ideal instrument for trying uh, very ambitious uh, and um, and sort of challenging research ideas um, on in very focused manner. I think the best part of uh, participating in 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 a feasibility study is that uh, you get it's it's places equal if not more importance on the research journey um, apart from the research project itself. Um, one thing which uh, I, I think a lot of uh, participants would agree with me or would be that due to the very short time scale of these feasibility studies, uh, you have to master how to work collaboratively very, uh, very closely with your co-eyes and uh, how to manage the project best. Um, and um, it basically how to get things done at your respective institution in faster manner, which itself is sort of a very useful skill. I believe, and on that note, um, uh, without delaying things further, um, I would like to move towards the feasibility study. The first feasibility study is titled as Manufacturing of 3D Printed Morphing Origami Solar Cells for the Next Generation of CubeSat. And it's being led by Stefania Soltini from University of Liverpool. Uh, the project is geared towards additive manufacturing approach to prototype new forms of morphing solar cells mechanisms for next generation of self-reconfigurable CubeSats. Uh, that sounds really exciting and I would hand over now to Stefania to uh, tell us more about the project. Good morning, I'm Stefania Soldini from the University of Liverpool and I'm PI of the feasibility study in manufacturing of a 3D printed origami solar sail for next generation of CubeSat. This grant has been funded by uh, EPSRC Connected Everything Network Plus. This project is a collaboration with different institutions, uh, the lead institution in the University of Liverpool, uh, I'm a guidance and navigation expert for uh, satellite, and my co Dr. Paolo Poletti from Liverpool, is um, head of the robotic lab. From the side of Oxford Space System, we have Dr. Juan Reveles, who is co-founder of the company and expert in deployable structures, uh, specifically in deployable antennas. From the side of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, we have Dr. Naoya Ozaki, that he is a, a CubeSat expert. And then we have Prof. Osamu Mori and Dr. Hamed Sugihara, that are from the Solar Sail Lab uh, in JAXA. Finally, Dr. Stefan Bonardi from the Robotic Lab in JAXA. We are also very lucky to have a mentor from the University of Sheffield, Prof. Iain Todd, um, from expert in future manufacturing. So, now let's start uh, talking with the, this feasibility study and imagine a very inspired approach towards space exploration. So imagine miniaturized satellite, small satellite that can explore like ant colonies um, 
coordinate and configure to um, overcome specific problem of task. So as ant colonies will uh, team up for solving different tasks, imagine an approach like this for space using small satellite, which we call CubeSat. Now, the biggest challenge for the space industry is how to make space mission adaptable and reliable. Well, a bio-inspired swarm of self-reconfigurable small satellite CubeSat can be the answer. The good news is that in 2018, NASA Mars Insight mission successfully tested CubeSat for deep space. So it's the first time that CubeSat has been used behind uh, Earth applications. And therefore, we think this is the right time to do this research. And the question is, how can the next generation of CubeSat perform multiple tasks? Well, the answer, we think, it lies in the Mura Ori Origami, uh, a pattern of, um, let's say, uh, origami um, folding that has been developed by Dr. Mura in 1970. Now, this type of folding um, developed by Dr. Mura are actually not new in space. They were initially proposed for folding solar panels. Uh, in fact, we have to um, we have to notice that satellite um, needs to be uh, compact during launch. So inside the launcher, all these deployable structure like solar panel and antennas need to be packed and stored inside the satellite. So this technique of origami was like a great uh, help for uh, finding technique for deploy for packing and then deploying space those uh, large structure. Now. The interesting thing is there are some other technology um, of origami in space used that is called solar sail. Now, what is a solar sail? A solar sail is a highly reflective, very thin uh, material that by reflecting the sunlight radiation can basically propel itself in space. So this is a similar principle of sailing boat, where the wind is actually what will propel your sailing boat, while in space we could use this Thin reflective film for um, basically solar sailing. And uh, this technology has been tested by JAXA, our partner uh, in the uh, Professor uh, Mori uh, lab, which is our collaborator, in 2010 with Icarus mission. Now, this is uh, a new um, technology. Uh, used for proof propell propellant free um, um, motion in space, but we think there are more application uh, for this technology. So how can solar cell technology enable self reconfiguration? So we are thinking now to develop the next generation of solar cell. And um, what the, we would like to achieve is having multi-operational CubeSat uh, that can change their shape, reconfigure themselves using harnessing the solar radiation pressure. So this is a challenge. Now, before talking about our challenges, how we would like to uh, prove this concept, we have to revise a little bit how solar cells are uh, defined. So a solar cell is uh, made of an aluminized membrane that is highly reflective and can reflect the sunlight. Then we have also two other parts that compose a solar cell. One are uh, solar array, which are needed to uh, power our satellite. And the very important one are these actuators called polymer dispersed liquid crystal. They are quite essential because they are very clever devices that by turning them on and off have the ability to change the optical properties of the sail which means we have a way to um, harness and um, control the, the uh, intensity of the sun radiation. So this was used by Icarus mission for attitude control, so for steering the sail. Now, we want to develop this idea further for th this challenge. So if you um, are aware about the origami robotic field, uh, for example, in this MIT um, uh, animation, this um, um, origami robot has been folded by uh, applying an external heat. 
Now, we don't want to use the heat of the sun radiation, but what we would like to use is this change of optical property to allow shape changing. For example, I can imagine um, like a sail used for um, sailing to arrive at a, a specific de destination and changes its shape, for example, for a different task, a different goal, like antennas for communicating with her. Now, how can we pass from a flat shape to a paraboloid shape? Possibly the idea uh, we have in mind is about um, using rapid prototyping to apply um, this uh, polymer dispersed liquid in a fully integrated manner in the membrane in a way in which by turning on and off each single facet, we can trigger uh, different forces acting on a cell and therefore achieving a different shape. Now, that's why we use rapid prototype because we would like to prove this concept. And um, the idea would be then to develop the next generation of solar cell that allow multi-purpose uh, CubeSat mini satellite. Now, this video was done by uh, Mr. Lubumanes, which is uh, our PhD candidate at the Robotic Lab. And he basically printed this um, facet uh, on a piece of paper just to demonstrate the fact that by printing this panel uh, with a specific pattern, we actually can achieve full folding. So this is a proof of concept in paper, but we want, of course, to develop it further. Now, if you want to read more about the project, you can go to the website of Connected Everything on the Feasibility Study, where you can find um, um, a note of how it works. Um, so let's talk about the schedule now and uh, what we would like to deliver in this project. Um, we have to revise our schedule from uh, our original plan. So this is a seven months project. It should, should have started in May, but due, due to the current situation, we have to revise the plan. Uh, and so it will be starting in September. So firstly, we have to hire a research assistant that is gonna work six months and lead the research. And basically, he, he or she has to work on um, prototyping uh, these uh, reflective control devices and, and how to distribute them, them on the membrane and which material use. So see if we can achieve a fully integrated um, um, solar sail. Uh, in this way. And uh, of course, now we have to do hybrid working from September. So the lab-based activity, so the lab are gonna be open and accessible to our research assistant, but any face-to-face uh, -face or work desk-based uh, work is gonna be in remote. So we have to revise um, uh, this, kind of, um, uh, this kind of plan. And uh, particularly, we expect that in 2021, there will be the sixth International Symposium of Solar Sailing, where we hope to show our results. And also we will uh, work on um, the next grant writing based on this feasibility study. So what did we do so far? Uh, we actually had a kickoff meeting with uh, uh, all the industrial partner in March. Uh, we also had a kickoff meeting with the Connected Everything, so I had the opportunity to meet uh, the other uh, project lead. Very, very interesting. I hope uh, we can have some collaboration. Um, I also had the chance, me and Dr. Paolo Pauletti, had the chance to meet with our mentor, Prof. Ian Todd, in uh, um, April. And then we, in May, in May, we have advertised a job post and um, and the good thing is by advertising the job post, actually a lot of students reach out to, to me uh, interested in this project. And in June, I had um, the, the, a student uh, that started working with me on an internship. He is um, from TU Delft and he was uh, interested to do an internship on this subject. Um, we received 21 applications. We have shortlisted five candidates and we just concluded the in interview session. So we are in the process of appointing, appointing uh, the research assistant. And also in September, inspired by this grant, we are going to have six students uh, on undergraduate beach, B and level that are going to work on a, a complementary topic to this one. Now, my uh, personal experience about um, sharing uh, this in this project with uh, for a job advert was very good. I could have 
Um, I had a very good list of candidates. It was very hard to pick um, a short list of candidates. We definitely had very good CV from different level. Um, a lot of students uh, have been interested in the project, even if they didn't apply for the position. So I received requests for voluntary research on the topic. And I think the main reason was because due to the current situation, I decided to record a YouTube video of my pitch panel interview sharing the idea of the project. And through Twitter and LinkedIn, I received a lot of student interest to work on um, internship or thesis with me on this topic, which is very good. So I think the great thing of this uh, feasibility study allowed me also to reach out a very good motivated student and start a new project as well. So at the moment, uh, the only person is working on a related project uh, that we are proposing here is uh, Mr. Alexander Fuke from TU Delft. So he's developing a cons conceptual feasibility study on control profile for origami shaped solar safe. So try to find what is the attitude control that we have to, to do and how to turn on and off those single facet to achieve a reconfiguration. So this is a four months project. Um, I also had the opportunity to set up some undergraduate project for next semester. So we are going to have uh, six students working on different aspects, for example, uh, a mission design, uh, a demonstrated mission uh, of, of a solar cell CubeSat that, for example, for Earth application for demonstrating this technology. Uh, a student will work on more origami robot and mirror origami idea, so investigating different geometry. Another one will, uh, will proceed the working attitude control that has been initiated by um, uh, Alexander. And then finally, some students will assist the research assistants on uh, material selection and the different uh, um, review on what is going to be best for rapid prototyping. So I think the, the good thing about this feasibility study, uh, we could have, ins we can inspire other students to support our research assistant. So opportunity for students to work on innovative concept, but also opportunity to, to undergraduate to have feedback from our industrial partner. So I think this is a very inspirational project for uh, uh, final year undergraduate student. Um, so we have also to develop a strategy for remote co collaboration. So um, as I said, we are going to have a hybrid um, research opportunity. That means the lab are going to be open, but then we have to reduce face-to-face uh, -face meeting. So I found useful with my students, especially um, Alexander, that unfortunately due to the current situation couldn't come in Liverpool, so we have to work in remote. I'm using this tool. So I'm using Slack for communication and chat. So student and researcher can actually contact me through a chat and ask me questions related to the project. For meetings, we use Microsoft Teams and Zoom. Document sharing, I use Overleaf. Um, I found very useful using Git repository for code sharing and document, also for backup and in the future also for making this project open source, hopefully. So, for example, I'm using Bitbucket. Um, this also, we are starting to write our project wiki and also we use Trello for planning uh, the milestone of each individual uh, team member. So what is good is all of these two are actually interacting with each other. So Slack actually is interfaced with Bitbucket. So I have some channel where I can see that people are working on a code or document or uploading stuff in Bitbucket. And also I can start Zoom chat in Slack. Um, another nice thing is um, Bitbucket is actually in uh, interface with the project wiki and the project planning of Trello. So each individual uh, that are, have access to the repository actually are contributed to keep and maintain the repository, but also planning uh, some milestone and tasks to be achieved. So this is how a strategy for the next uh, uh, six months until the situation is as it is. And um, finally, I think um, the idea with this um, project will be to um, use the result of our proof of concept for um, formalizing a new proposal. And uh, I think 
it will be uh, a continued long-lasting collaboration with JAXA at Oxford State System, and it will be the idea, um, I, the vision I have, and the reason for why I wanted to check these technologies, because I'm thinking about a swarm of self-reconfigurable robotic CubeSat that can achieve different um, tasks in space. So, for example, using solar sacred technology for um, propulsion and then for reassembling and maybe land on another planet. So this is um, the goal that we have in mind. And at the end of this project, we are planning to submit a propo proposal on this topic. So thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any question, uh, please contact me. Thanks, Stefania, uh, for a very nice presentation. We have a few questions in Q&A session. Um, basically, uh, uh, Pete has asked that this is a great looking project. Just wondered what form of 3D printing you are looking to use and if this could change in future. Stefania, I think we need to put your microphone on, please. Stefania, I can I cannot hear you. Uh, can anybody else hear? Uh, let me try. Yeah, I think in this case we can we can use the Q and A chat maybe to um, for the discussion. I think that's better. But um, thanks thanks for your. A great presentation, and um, uh, I think I'll hand over to the second feasibility study. Uh, Stefania, if you can, can you hear us, or can you see us? In, oh, you can hear. Uh, there are a few questions in Q and A session. Uh, if we can take those questions there um, in, in the chat, that would be great. Is that okay. Um, so I think what we'll do is, as Ali said, if we move on to the next presentation, but Stefania, if we can make sure we keep all those questions. Um, and Stefania, I think it's probably easiest if you put some of the answers in the chat rather than the Q&A. Um, and Sally will make sure we capture the questions as well. So thanks, Ali. Thank you. Uh, the second feasibility study is titled as Embedded Intelligent Empathy in Design, uh, and it's led by Dr. Anna Hadzim Hali. Uh, the project uh, is geared to explore how empathy can be integrated into digital design intrinsically at the design stage, which is quite interesting. Uh, so I would now hand over to Anna uh, for her presentation. Good morning. Welcome to the presentation of our feasibility study entitled Embedded Intelligent Empathy. My name is Anna Hadzimihali, and I'm a senior lecturer in design in the University of West of England. I am here today with two of my co-investigators, Dr. Mirat Barakat and Dr. Yaya Lavapur, who are also going to talk you through different aspects of this work. In the next few minutes, I'm going to present you an overview of the project and explain how we come up with the idea. Then Mirat, who is an expert in computational design, will take over and explain what we call as the mind behind this work. Yaya will continue talking about the role of empathy in the design workflow and explain the heart behind this project. I'm going to wrap up this presentation with some ideas on the future of computational design in the end. In my previous working lifetime, I was in the field of intellectual property. And 
Patent attorneys deal with the question, who is the owner or who is the inventor on a daily basis? Now, very recently, this discussion or this debate has been live, especially in, in patent offices around the world, where they talk about whether a computer can be a named inventor on a patent. Now, at the philosophical level, this is not a new question. From Victorian literature to science fiction, we have been discussing about the ethics of our creation for a long time. But how will this connect with this project? Because this is not a project about Victorian monsters or robot rides. Personally, I am an engineer by background, and I had the luck to work as a design academic with architects such as Murat and Yaya. And this question of whether the machine is the author or the tool is what sparked the creativity behind this work. This project poses the question at a very practical level. So we are challenging the role of computational tools that are shaping our world right now. And we're putting this question at the context of design practice. But what do I mean with the term design practice? And Yaya will explain more on that later. So for now, consider that we all want to be surrounded by products, objects and spaces that we connect at an emotional level. And to have that, we depend on the intuition of the designer. So it is her responsibility to uncover the hopes, the dreams and the desires of the user in order to create what users want. In this sense, empathy is at the core of design and empathy is a function of design, but design is also a function of empathy. This idea that empathy is the core of design or the heart of design came up around the 20th century. That's when design training also focused on intuition and user-centeredness. However, today we move to more automated design approaches. We use large data sets, computational logic and optimization in order to come up with products, objects or spaces that sometimes look nothing like a human designed them. And this is exactly where this project lies. We want to understand what is the role of empathy in an automated design future. The main goal of this project in this feasibility study is to develop empathy-centered design computation. But so far we haven't defined what design computation really is. And I'm going to pose this question to Murat, who is an expert on design computation and is going to present the origins of the field as well as its evolution. Good question, Anna. To understand the dilemma we are tackling in this feasibility study, First, we need to contextualize the evolution of applied science in design. Hi, I'm Mirat Barakhet, a senior lecturer in computational design at UWE, and my research focuses on the human response to the sounding environment. Now, if the 1900s were considered the century of physics, the 21st century has proven to be the era of applied biological system models. With the computational design progressively maturing from a passive role to a more automated or generative design aid tool. In the late 1900s, Greg Lynn emerged as one of the pioneers of the field. He employed contemporary CAD platforms like 3D Max. He built a model of his embryological house in search of new artistic expressions. In the abstract, it is not unlike a simple rectangle that has parameters like length and width. These new forms are simply an aggregation of a series of parameters. If the designer changes one, a cascade of changes alters the final intervention. In essence, parametric design was born of the designer's empathy. In response, there became a backlash of criticism of the form, where it was argued that this blob-like architecture could not be constructed. So the field progressively expanded into engineering considerations to find the new ways of construction. And in the British Museum's great court ceiling, the target shifted towards formulating structural optimization and algorithms. As in the Shard in London, design decisions can now optimize according to a myriad of parameters, like structural, environmental, material, and acoustical. We can also compete for manufacturing and budget optimization. 
With the integration of mathematical and biological models and genetic algorithms, the possibilities became endless. Moreover, the algorithm design not only aims to find solutions, but to also validate unexpected solutions and rank them based on the fitness criteria. It can be argued that without comp computational design, the integration of soundscape, sonic design, acoustic ecologies could not be integrated into the architectural design process. The Iowa Concert Hall ceiling optimizes acoustics as an artistic expression. These new forays into sound and computational design attempt to close the loop and return to the search of artistic expression. So here, we, we start to find the tension Anna spoke about. Computational design has progressively been criticized for losing the artistic expression, and the line between author and tool became blurry. For example, these two designs. They are un unusually looking buildings, for sure. Artistically, they may not appeal to you, or maybe they do. Without context, they seem unnecessarily flashy. But if I tell you that this building is designed solely based on three rules of swarm intelligence, in nature, these three rules create complex systems like a school of fish. Separation, so they do not bump into each other. Alignment, so they can collectively move toward a target. Cohesion, so they maintain a large formation to fend off prey. We can use these biological models to consider the technical aspects of design, like this building's skin, structure, and services are designed together as a complex and cohesive system. Now this project is a step closer to our target. The designers use social logic to design a vertical university campus in Manhattan. They employed agent-based systems where the agents were students moving in space with speed, target, the behaviors included negotiation, collaboration, and competition to achieve their individual and collective goals. Again, again, a complex system with simple rules. The behavior algorithms include a number of biological models like the shortest path, which we learn from ants. And again, the argument here is where is the designer's role? Is it in using the tool or designing the tool? And specifically, where is the designer's empathy in this process? To answer these questions, we found that the sound in phenomena is a good candidate to focus on in this feasibility study. The human response to sound goes beyond merely the acoustical phenomena. Physics tells us the, so the sonic energy dissipates exponentially with distance from the source. Technically, it's true, maybe for a machine or an equation, but to humans, not all sonic events are created equal. As we can see in the graph on the right, the human auditory organ and brain receptors register different perceived loudnesses for different frequencies. Furthermore, when multiple events co-occur, the perceived loudness depends on several subjective aspects. Am I paying attention to the event? Is it within the line of sight? Can I understand the information broadcasted by the signal? Is another one overshadowing it? Does it have a historical, cultural, or evolutionary significance? Several research groups are looking at quantifying soundscape perception. Axelson, Nilsson, and Berglund argue that basic dimensions of soundscape must be quantified to improve the sounding environment through design. They plotted qualitative surveyed categorizations like calm, pleasant, dramatic, lifeless on an attribute scale. Sound is a complex ephemeral phenomena. We argue that this complexity and the maturity of compl computational design primes the field to generate a model of empathy. But how? Let's ask Yaya how the heart of design can be systematically integrated into computational design. My name is Yaya. I'm a senior lecturer in architecture at UE. My research looks at environmental design and form-finding methods using computer simulation and parametric design. So in order to answer the question that Mirat raised, uh, we should first put the word design into context and see where empathy sits within the design process. So a quick flashback to the um, last century. Design as we call it today was mainly craft oriented intuitive process. And then with modernism, scientific knowledge was added to design. So by the late 20th century, we had two established cultures in design science, looking at objectivity, rationality, and basically searching for truth and 
humanities, looking at subjectivity, imagination, or the search for justice. But what was a pivotal point um, in design around 1980s was the recognition of empathy as a value which had been largely neglected. So we had truth, justice, and now we're searching for appropriateness. And since the turn of the century, uh, with the use of computational um, design, the opportunity has been to find a way to control subjectivity within an objective system. But here we should be careful that machine doesn't take control and empathy is achieved without designers losing their autonomy. And I mentioned about machine being the author or the two. The question broadens here, and we can ask if the designer is an author or consultant and the computer or the machine is only a tool. I believe as a designer, we need to have some ownership and autonomy. But at the same time, we should stay within the empathic expectations. If we look at conventional ways of designing, even when we use computing to design, as we can see here in this chart, empathy is integrated at the rationalization stage where a designer gathers information and makes assumptions based on their education or personal views to design with empathy. Then it goes to an optimization stage so that the machine or the computer fixes or fine tunes other functional, functional or practical issues. But still there are a lot of subjectivity in designing with empathy because it is based on assumptions. But if anything, empathy is where you put your assumptions aside. And the argument is that uh, the information that a designer gathers should be analyzed when designers situate themselves in a mental state of others rather than perceiving their situation. So we are adjusting the workflow to optimize empathy within the rationalization stage so that the subjective rational empathy is replaced by an embedded intelligent empathy adding objectivity to the process of empathic design. How we are going to systematically embed empathy into an intelligent system? We start by looking at a design process as a theory, and more specifically looking into two domains within the discourse of design. One, designer's empathy, and second, computational design. At this point, I should note that we only use Soundscape as a testbed to design, and this project has implication um, in other aspects of design, such as form, aesthetics, light, and so on. The method that we are using is based on participatory design uh, sessions with our industrial partners by conducting uh, co-design sessions with them, we will better understand the empathic aspect of their design and using the conversations and dialogues in the sessions and in the focus groups, we create a data set using an affinity diagram method, which is a type of uh, thematic analysis, which then can be translated or can be used to create a model of empathy in the form of a plugin for Grasshopper 3D, with the hope that this will enable designers to methodically generate emotional connection with users and systematically embed empathy in the process of design through computational and algorithmic thinking. Back to you, Anna. Thank you very much, Yaya. So this project is an interdisciplinary collaboration between academics, 
and industrial partners. Our academic group covers a large range of fields, from architecture to product design and product development, as well as architecture. And our industrial partners come from the area of computational design and smart products. Going back to the question whether computational design is or should be an author or a tool, our answer is that it can be either. And within our team, we actually disagree. This is what, after all, sparked the conversation here. But in either case, we all agree that we need computational design that intuitively connects with us and can help us shape the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anna, for a very nice presentation. Um, and we have a couple of questions in Q&A. The first question is, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I think I can hear you. Uh -huh, you okay. Hear me and see me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you and see you. Uh, so yeah, the first question is from Pete. He's asking that, is it correct to say that some of these buildings, uh, he's talking about the case study, which was mentioned in the video, were designed using something like reinforcement learning, where some agents explore a virtual environment and they learn from it and evolve um, in a way that you can design the buildings on the base of uh, this sort of trial and error kind of method. Um, so he's, he's, he's saying that is this the approach taken uh, towards the design um, yeah. in that sort of scenario? Uh, the quick answer is yes. So this type of uh, learning methods and algorithms were used to design those buildings where virtual agents explore the environment and they create a map. And I think that more on that can... Um, Murat can comment more on that, who is actually run those projects. And I think she will, she's preparing actually an answer that will go in the chat and she can elaborate more on the role of virtual agents and reinforced learning on those projects. Okay. Um, Sarah has raised a very interesting point. She's saying that she's interested in how, how did you build your multidisciplinary team? Uh, you seem to have quite a lot, good mix of uh, different disciplines addressing a focused question. So she's saying, did you have any challenges in understanding each other's perspective? I mean, developing the common vocabulary to discuss yeah. uh, the research problem? We, we had a lot of challenges and we had a lot of challenges with the communication as well as with the visuals that were going into the projects. For example, where Mirat was talking about the embryonic house, because I have an engineering background, I couldn't understand if this was a house or if there was a chair or if it was a house, where is the door, for example, and concepts where for architects are kind of common knowledge, but for the rest of the population who don't share the same language, it is not. So we had to define the terms that we were using many times. And I think we had to go back to the basics and this understanding of what is science and what is uh, computation and what is design as, um, as, as concepts, basically. Um, I think a last question um, from Ian is, um, he is asking that, how do you define empathy? Isn't this an effective quality? Just do you need to model this in your computational framework somehow? Well, the, the way that we define empathy is basically we, with, we're looking at it as a state. So empathy in the way that the designer understands the needs of the user. And we are trying to understand at what kind of state does the designer enter in order to gain this understanding and empathy is is um can be seen in various contexts for example a nurse shows empathy towards her patients but in a way we are trying to understand how how that how does this it, it can be interpreted as a feeling but we're trying to understand what are the main points where where um designers create those connections with the users and how they integrate them within their process of designing new uh, objects or new spaces. 
Thanks, thanks a lot, Anna. I think in, in, in the interest of time and keeping the session on time, I would move to the next presentation. But if, if anybody has any more question and answer, they can post it in Q&A session and they'll be picked up from there. Thank That's you. Great. Thank you. Thank thanks. You. So the third and the final feasibility study is titled as Agent Chat, a feasibility of large scale multi-agent based coordination for free co-loading. Uh, this uh, feasibility study is led by Alexandra Printrup uh, the, from University of Cambridge. The project is geared towards multi-agent approaches for optimization of free co-loading. Um, and I'll hand over to Alexandra now. Hi, everyone. This is Alexandra Printrup from the University of Cambridge's engineering department. I will be talking to you today about a feasibility study funded by the Connected Everything Network entitled Agent Chat. The project is in collaboration with the Value Chain Labs, which is a logistics service provider company based in London, and Fetch AI, a Cambridge-based startup company that specializes in agent-based technology. Our study will be starting in September and will last for a year. So this presentation consists of our current thoughts and plans for investigation. The primary motivation for our project is sustainability. As many of you probably are aware, the UK is committed to the net zero target for greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2050. We need to find ways to embrace this target and incorporate it in our daily lives. Logistics is one such activity that impacts all of us. Everything you have in your home has in some way been delivered from somewhere to be with you. Most of that stuff is carried with what we call heavy goods vehicles, HGVs, which account for 5% of the UK's total greenhouse gas emissions. HGVs are the hardest types of vehicles to decarbonize due to their power requirements. Freight capacity in the UK and Europe is significantly underutilized, leading to higher costs, environmental damage and congestion. Only 63% of journeys carry useful load, and average vehicle utilization remains under 60% by weight or volume. 29% of distance. What we would like to investigate is collaboration in logistics. Collaboration involves the sharing of truck capacity between one or more sending parties to receiving destinations. Both academic and industry research estimates that freight collaboration can improve vehicle fill, remove unproductive journeys with a potential of 20% 20 cost savings and 25% of carbon dioxide reduction for collaborative shipments. Now take a look at the picture on the right. The left hand side of this picture shows a non-collaborative logistics case where three companies depicted in red, blue and green work in isolation. A square here is a depot where the goods are stored at the beginning of the problem. The stars are the nodes which the company must deliver to. Each truck has a certain capacity here. On the right hand side, you see the collaborative case. Since the red company has to deliver items nearby where blue also needs to deliver to, it would make sense that the red could also satisfy these orders if it helps reduce the overall system cost then we can share the gains in a fair manner. There have been many studies that show cost savings of about 20 to 30 percent, with the first notable paper being from Creason in the year 2007. Suppliers will reduce transportation costs, trucks will utilize their trucks more and will earn more. Retailers would see reduced congestion and of course the biggest winner is the environment. So why is it not happening? Truck co-loading is a tricky problem. Co-located or close suppliers would not know whether they are sending items to similar locations at similar times. Somebody needs to tell them. For retailers to tell them, orchestrating co-loading involves transactional costs. The benefits of tracking co-loading may not necessarily outweigh the costs of manual co-loading orchestration for them. Logistics providers could be a mediator, but then suppliers would need to use the same logistics providers, and that creates a lockdown effect, which is not suitable to the needs of sporadic journeys 
or short-term contracts. There may be a third-party mediator. That mediator could orchestrate and tell suppliers where to deliver items at what times. But then, for this to work, multiple suppliers will need to sign up and pay for it, which they may not want to do. And crucially, optimization algorithms are not well developed for this type of problem. Most approaches oversimplify these problems, and multiple survey papers are recommending that we consider richer, more real-world vehicle routing problems. The core idea of our feasibility study is the automation of this co-loading process through agent-based systems. Software agents are goal-seeking computational entities. The field of computer science often conceptualizes the field of AI with intelligent agents, which are computational programs that mimic and then act on behalf of a human user. Intelligent agents sense and perceive the environment they are in. They take actions to maximize the probability of achieving their goals. And they can use various tools to do so, including the ability to learn from data, for example, using machine learning, develop reasoning, for example, using logic, and communicate and negotiate with other agents. They can evolve to adapt to changing circumstances and find solutions through search and optimization algorithms. Each of these abilities have formed specialized AI subfields with different technical considerations. So agents are a great encapsulation mechanism to leverage what AI has to offer today to the collaborative logistics problem and automate it. In our case, agent chat will involve two key aspects. First is a distributed, decentralized multi-agent system to automate co-loading, and second is a learning algorithm to minimize the optimization burden by helping agents to learn from past problems. Just to note that multi-agent systems is not to be confused with multi-agent simulation. In this case, we are intending that our intelligent agents do real-life actions through deployment on web-based systems. The agent-based system may involve multiple architectural options, each of which will give different outcomes in terms of scalability and optimality, which constitutes the main research question in this project. Now let's look at this one. Here we have a centralized system. We have two main categories of agents. First of those is the supply chain representative agents here. They represent entities that are involved in logistics, such as suppliers, retailers, and logistics service providers. The second category involves learning agents for dispatching delivery tasks and finding co-loading opportunities. Here, dispatchers may receive incoming delivery tasks from suppliers and then assign a co-loading decision maker agent based on salient features and probabilities sorry, properties of the problem, such as the destination of the delivery. For example, the dispatcher agent may assign all delivery tasks to London or Greater London to a co-loading decision maker agent. In this way, we, have, we will have clusters of groups where we have individual optimization problems. This is a centralized approach that matches delivery tasks with logistics providers. The optimization problem will involve a trade-off between minimum overall cost of delivery with minimum distance traveled. Now, would the system be flexible enough to accommodate changing individual preferences of agents or scalable enough to accommodate large dynamically changing optimization problems? An alternative approach could involve decentralization. Here, supply chain agents publish tasks to a blackboard. They then pick a collaborator to form a coalition, and then together they will task a logistics agent with suitable capacity. However, here supply chain agents need to publish information on a common blackboard, which they may not like to do due to confidentiality issues. Details will also be important here. If there are multiple supply chain agents with complementary loads, who would the agents pick? Can they pick more than one agent? Perhaps they can pick only two, and then if the logistics agent notices additional capacity, it can prompt a further coalition to form. As this is a distributed approach, supplier matches may not be optimal. 
However, it's more scalable and it may be a more flexible system. Another key issue here is that the opinion of logistic providers will be left out. Trucks may not have capacity by the time agents reach them. An iteration over this could involve giving logistics agents an optimization task, where they also have a choice over which pairings they will choose based on their own goals. This may be a good trade-off between optimality and scalability. So our job in the next few months will be to test these various scenarios and more in terms of total and individual cost reductions, capacity utilization, and the reduction of total carbon on the roads. Let me talk to you a little bit about technology used for the multi-agent platform. The agent system is open source and complies with FIPA protocols. The platform offers blockchain support for transactions between agents, which we won't be using at this stage, but may be useful in the future. Devices can also be connected to the system. There's an open economy framework, which hosts all the agents and allows them to find, to each, find each other and talk to each other. The platform has Edge as its own development language and offers Python and JavaScript APIs. For this project, on the agent front, our current explorations involve finding out which agent organizations would be suitable for the freight co-loading problem, whether such a system would be scalable to host a large number of agents and messages, and what sorts of considerations need to be taken into account for industrial adoption. As we have seen from our different thought experiments, that there are various trade-offs involved between agent architectures and scalability in this problem. A question we would like to explore further in the future is whether we can change architectures dynamically over time, depending on the constraints that we are facing in the problem. Let me talk you through a little bit about the optimization problem we are facing here. I mentioned several different objectives. Suppliers want to reduce costs. Trucks want to increase utility. Sharing a truck will decrease fuel toss costs by the truck, and some of those savings will be passed on to the supplier. On the whole, we want to reduce total distance traveled subject to some constraints. Matching a supplier to another one involves tricky constraints. Pellets can come in all shapes and sizes, and more importantly, different densities. A pellet of water is very dense, but a pellet of crisps is very light, for example. Therefore, there's a multi-objective optimization problem of maximizing both the weight limit and the volume available in the truck. Furthermore, because trucks are rear loaded, the order in which we load and unload the pellets in and out of the truck really matters. Further, we cannot put heavy goods on top of light goods, for example, and we cannot put food with contaminants together. Frozen items need to go with frozen items and ambient items with ambient items. These kinds of problem settings haven't really been properly investigated in literature. One problem that has also not been tackled by prior literature is the example of less than truckload transportation of pallets of goods. The closest that previous papers have come to was studying less than truckload transportation of parcels, where because the parcels are so small, they take up negligible volume. Therefore, problems have assumed that the truck has infinite capacity. So for us to attack this problem, two separate bits of literature need to come together. First of these is the container loading problem, which tries to maximize the load in a vehicle subject to certain constraints, and the vehicle routing problem, which minimizes total distance traveled again subject to some constraints, such as the vehicle being at a certain location in a certain time window. Both of these problems are NP-hard, and they will need to come together in order to address a problem which we call vehicle routing with loading constraints. In terms of an optimization vehicle for this problem, we will be looking into reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning works with reward functions based on states that an agent has been given at a certain task. While it has seen tremendous success in games, it hasn't really been applied to industrial domains yet. Reinforced learning will be inherently suitable to the decentralized problem at hand. 
So in summary, we are proposing and testing the feasibility of a new approach to collaborative logistics in this exciting new project. Key novelties will include an exploration of trade-offs involved in various different agent system architectures, formulation of the vehicle routing problem with loading constraints, and applying cooperative reinforcement learning based multi-agent systems in a real life setting. Get in touch with us if you're interested and thank you very much for listening to our presentation. Many thanks, Alexandra, for a very exciting presentation. Um, there are a couple of questions, I think. Um, the first question is that due to the current situation, uh, there is a lot of increase in online shopping and online buying. Um, and Stefania is suggesting that uh, companies like Amazon uh, would have immense sort of volume of data around uh, supply chain logistics. Uh, have you considered collaborating with with Amazon or say Ocado or companies like those? Um, not yet, um, but we are um, we we have um, scheduled in um, two workshops uh, within this feasibility study. So initially, we are um, going to be working with a London-based logistics company called Value Chain Labs, and they are providing us the data sets. Use, um, to search for collaboration opportunities and sort of it, it will ground us in real life. And um, in terms of Amazon, um, they are local, we know them, um, and uh, we will be inviting them to our workshops. Um, we would especially like to work with SMEs though, so supply, I, I, we believe that um, sort of they are that it's it's really important to include them in this conversation because ultimately um, we want to have a decentralized system where everybody can share gains. So it's not just the logistics providers that we need to approach to, but also the shippers um, make use of this system. Uh, Sarah has asked, what are the particular challenges in bringing a uh, loading uh, problem with uh, vehicle routing? Um, problem. So what are the particular changes when we try to combine these two different problems together? So um, in the literature, um, surprisingly, they have been treated separately. Um, and I think we, although we haven't sort of you know, gotten our hands dirty with the with the with the maths of it yet, um, because of the NP hard nature of um, both of these problems. Um, so they are both combinatorial um, optimization problems um, and heavily constrained problems as well. Um, it's going to be uh, feasibility of solution solutions, and I think also the uh, the, the solution search space is going to be um, non. Uh, homogeneous so uh so we'll need to we are, we are currently thinking about using heuristic approaches as well as reinforcement learning so that that's what really motivates the, the reinforcement learning um approach at the moment okay so i think that that sort of answers the next question which was what is the main advantage of using reinforcement learning as compared to more traditional sort of evolutionary computing approaches like genetic programming for for this kind of application Yes, absolutely. I think um, reinforcement learning is great because it's uh, specially designed for decentralized um, problems like this. Um, and uh, there has been applications of um, coalition formation using reinforcement learning uh, algorithms embedded in agents um, in game settings, online games, um, but not really much in industrial systems. And we believe that um, if we approach to this um, uh, co-loading problem between suppliers, so shippers, um, I think uh, as a coalition formation problem, um, the reinforcement learning might might help us yeah another question is that is it relevant to smart factory for optimized space uh, slash path planning I mean, can, can this work be applied in that sort of setup um it's the first time i'm thinking about this question so i'm not sure it yes. might be um i think the dynamics are a bit different i think you know if you're looking at uh, path planning and uh, if you're sending item so you, you're kind of planning a route and on that route you're going to stop multiple times to combine sh 
you know, um, items to reach to a certain destination um, or a set of destinations, it, it might be, uh, yeah, more widely applicable. Um, uh, another question is that can we learn from those who have been addressing the loading problem over the years, such as those who work in delivery and truck loading? There might be really interesting insights which we, we can gain by learning from those people. Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, we are involved in discussions with um, uh, the Knowledge Transfer Network, uh, who has kindly put us in touch with um, other um, researchers, um, especially operations research community uh, in the UK, who has been uh, looking at uh, vehicle routing problems. And, um, um, and, and these are mostly maths departments, I would say. So I think it will be um, interesting to compare what our decentralized um, uh, approach uh, yields in comparison to to uh, to a more traditional centralized mathematical um, programming type approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is that: Are you aware of the work that has been done relating to this in uh, the automotive and aerospace sector? Um, Ian is suggesting to have a look at DigiCore and perhaps sudden EU projects. Um, not really. So in terms of um, automotive sector, uh, I think a lot of the time um, vehicle um, routing problems have been studied uh, within this type of area. So now I think the difference uh, with us is that first of all we are combining vehicle routing and um, and co container uh, loading. So so that is one um, sort of um, difficulty that that we are uh, we are trying to um, trying to face. Um, and the other one is the multi stakeholder nature of this problem. So, uh, you know, you, you, we, are, we don't, everybody has to gain. Um, so shippers need to be incentivized because uh, to share truckloads, um, they will need to, uh, they need to gain something from it because it imposes them extra constraints like uh, I have to now wait a bit longer to ship. Uh, for example, or I have to, um, I have to, uh, you know, work with somebody else's constraints, and the same thing with the with the logistics providers. So um, they need to sort of increase their journey, uh, but also gain by improved utilization. So this kind of multi-stakeholder nature of the problem hasn't been explored yet. But thank you very much for that suggestion, um, Ian. I will I will take a look at the DigiCore uh, project. Um, there is a question from Sarah that is there a reluctance to share information from some companies? Well, some companies want to keep these data private. So in terms of the logistic data, if you're trying to use real world to solve the problem, is there a reluctance in, uh, for example, bigger companies like Amazon? Is, is there a business and commercial sensitivity around that sort of data? Yeah, so uh, we are envisaging that there will be um, both sensitivities and uh, in the logistics uh, provider side and also in the shipper side. Um, so for that, we are uh, thinking about two different uh, solution approaches. One is architectural. So based on the um, architecture, um, we might use a centralized or a semi-centralized agent that is collecting data from multiple stakeholders in a secure and private manner and doing the optimization. Another approach, of course, is that um, is that suppliers, um, they, they talk to each other. Uh, but for that, they have to let go a little bit about their privacy. So, um, so I think this project uh, is exciting in that sense as well. What, you know, what, what are you hoping to gain and what are you hoping to sacrifice in terms of privacy um, from an agent uh, communication perspective? Mm -hmm. I think there are a couple of more questions in Q&A, but in the interest of time, I would say that, you know, maybe you can reply it in the session um, and uh, I would hand over to Sarah. Th thanks uh, a lot, everyone who has presented this morning. It's been really nice to hear um, the talks and there is a lot of synergy um, of, across these three very different problems, but using sort of a distributed intelligence angle uh, in each of the problem to solve a slightly different challenge and bringing in different dynamics of that particular problem uh, into uh, the overall framework. Um, I would strongly like to encourage those who have research interests aligned with these feasibility studies to get in touch with people who are leading them. 
um, potentially uh, that can uh, lead to new collaborations and you know uh, maybe different directions where this feasibility to studies can be applied, different applications if you if you can uh, think of it that uh, we are aligned to your own research areas. So with that, let me pass the virtual stage to Sarah. Thanks. Thank you, Ali, and thank you to you for chairing the session. I think uh, um, it was a, a series of really, really interesting presentations. Um, I think the thing that, that sort of struck me was um, the, the sort of threads of novel use of technology, um, uh, the, the sort of people elements, I think, came through, um, but also the innovation and the creativity. And one of the things that I would say that all three of those feasibility studies demonstrate is, is the value of a good idea. And that little idea doesn't need to be um, uh, particularly sort of dramatic or, or, or sort of world changing, but just that nugget of, of a way of thinking differently about something. Um, and I think that that's a way that, um, uh, that, that, that actually feasibility studies can really work effectively um, in terms of stimulating some of the larger um, ambitions and, and wider funding projects that we might have. Um, I'd like to thank Stefania as well. It's a shame that your microphone didn't work, Stefania, but thank you very much because I know you answered a lot of questions on the chat as well. That and we're hoping to now. hear from you later in the conference as well. So, um, oh, is it working now, Stefania? Yeah, I, I found the option. I couldn't find it earlier. Apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 don't apologize at all, but thank you because I know you did um, uh, lots of these. Um, uh, lots of the questions being answered on the chat as well. So, so that's fantastic. So um, I think now um, the thing, of course, that we don't get in a virtual conference is the university buffet. Um, but if you can visualize yourselves queuing up, maybe you should all do this in your own homes or offices, queue up, uh, choose the things that look tasty, avoid the things that uh, don't look quite so tasty. Um, uh, and then um, a session that we're going to have at one o'clock um, is a completely informal session for you to um, meet those of us from the Connected Everything project team who are just happy to answer your questions. And it can be, I think it can be questions about anything. I haven't really checked with the others, but um, obviously we're happy to talk about um, uh, the, the network, um, our ambitions for the network, our plans for future feasibility study calls. We're really interested in how we can engage more with industry um, in some of our future feasibility studies as well. So any thoughts or ideas, but, but Actually, there's opportunity for you to ask questions about career developments or ideas you might have for work we could do in the network. We're at a really nice stage in the network at the moment where we've still got two years to go. We've got the core framework in place, but there's a real opportunity for members of the network to influence the types of things that we may wish to um, address in the future. So now is your time um, to ask those questions. Um, so we'll see you um, at one o'clock. If you um, uh, register, you have to sort of go back to the, the, the sort of the website and um, log into a slightly different session this time, but it's all very straightforward and you all made it here in the first place. So um, thank you very much for your participation this morning. Um, thank you to all of our speakers again. We need to work out, Sally, how to do a collective virtual applause. Um, and uh, um, really look forward to um, seeing you all um, later on today. Thank you.